to this listening session hosted by the Racial Equity in Policing Commission of Salt Lake City. I'm Larry Schooler. We all want to feel safe. We all want to be treated fairly and equitably. How we do that, how we ensure racial equity in the policing of our community is a complicated question with lots of possible answers. That's why we're here. In other meetings, you may have felt like a spectator. Tonight, you, the people of Salt Lake City, are the guests of honor. Your mayor, city council, police chief, and racial equity in policing commissioners are all here to listen to your perspective. They want to know about your experiences with the Salt Lake City Police Department, good and not as good. They also want to know what you would change about how the police department does its work from recruitment and training to policies and practices, both on school campuses and across the city. You have the microphone. It's your turn. In order to participate tonight, we want to invite you to call us at 888-410-3427. Again, 888-410-3427. En español, 844-881-1317. That's 844-881-1317 for a Spanish simulcast. In order to participate via text message, you can send a text Equity SLC with no spaces. That's Equity SLC to the number 22333. Again, that's Equity SLC, no spaces, to the phone number 22333. Once you send that text, you'll be able to respond to polls that'll flash up on the screen here in just a moment. If you're listening to me on the phone, we'll be asking you questions that you can answer using your touchtone phone. Any way you join us tonight, we are excited to have you and we look forward to listening. So we're going to start with a question about what part of Salt Lake City do you live or work in? So for those listening on the phone, we have a two-part question here because of how many choices we've provided to the public. And so you'll initially have three choices. And if you don't hear your neighborhood in these first few choices, just stand by and we're going to read a longer list of neighborhood choices. So if you live in the or work in the Sugar House area, you'll press one on the phone. If you live or work in downtown or central city, you'll press two. And if you're in Glendale or Poplar Grove, you will press three. Again, we're going to read four other areas of the city here in just a moment. But if you're in Sugar House, you can press one. Downtown Central City, press two. Or Glendale and Poplar Grove, please press three. And if you haven't heard your neighborhood come up yet, stand by and we're going to read out uh, a few other choices for you. And again, on screen, if you've texted Equity SLC to 22333, once that text goes through, you can just text the letter of your choice and the results will populate automatically. Alternatively, if you'd like to go online, you can go to pollev.com forward slash equity SLC and the polls will populate on that website and you can answer uh, directly from the web. Again, for those of us listening by phone, uh, what part of Salt Lake City do you live or work in? Here are the first few choices. If you live and work in Sugar House, press one. Downtown and Central City, press two. Glendale or Poplar Grove, press three. And then if none of those apply to you, we're going to read out a couple of other choices that are up on the screen. So we'll give it just another moment here before we move things along. Looks like Sugar House is well represented here tonight. It's great to have folks from all across the city. For our phone callers, we're gonna give you four other choices now. Uh, if you didn't hear your part of Salt Lake City come out in that first batch, we're gonna give you a, a few other choices here in uh, just a moment. So if you are in the, uh, I believe we'll have four other choices ready here in just a second, if I can get our folks to advance to that question. If you are in Rose Park or the Northwest Quadrant and are on the phone, press one. That's Rose Park Northwest Quadrant, press one. For Liberty Wells, you can press two. For Avenues, University, or East Bench, press three. And if you are joining us from outside of Salt Lake City, we invite you to press four. Once again, that's Rose Park Northwest Quadrant, press one on the phone. Liberty Wells, press two. 
Avenues University and East Bench, press three. Or if you don't live in Salt Lake City, we welcome you nevertheless, and you can press four. Thanks to all of you for responding to this initial poll. And we've got some other questions on the substance of our topic here coming up in just a moment. Let's move on to our next question, which will help get at the uh, question of uh, racial equity by finding out a little bit more about your own race or ethnicity. For those who are texting, you don't need to do anything different. You can just pick the letter of your choice. Uh, if for some reason you picked the wrong one, you can text CLEAR and it will take away your answer and you can uh, go again. The web users can just go to that original uh, website. For those listening to me on the phone, we're now going to pose a question about what is your race or ethnicity? So stand by and we'll give you some choices to choose from for that question. If you are of uh, American Indian or Alaska Native uh, descent, you will press one. American Indian or Alaska Native, press one. Black or African American, please press two. African, please press three. Hispanic, Latino, or Chicano, or Latinx, press four. And Middle Eastern, press five. I'll read those one more time. For American Indian or Alaska Native, press one. Black or African American, plus press two. African, press three. Hispanic, Latino, or Chicano, press four. Or Middle Eastern, press five. And if you haven't heard your choice yet, we are going to give you a few other choices here in just a short moment. And as, as uh, you can see on the screen, you can text the letter of your choice uh, to the 22333 number that we gave you just a minute ago. All right, let's give the other choices for the race or ethnicity question for the uh, callers. If you are a native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander, uh, please press one. Again, native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander, press one. Southeast Asian, please press two. White, please press three, or some other race or ethnicity that we haven't uh, listed so far, please press four. Once again, that's Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander, press one. Southeast Asian, please press two. White, please press three. Or if it's another race or ethnicity that we haven't called so far, please press four. Once again, if you're just joining us, this is a listening session for the community of Salt Lake City for the Racial Equity in Policing Commission. I'm Larry Schooler, joined by Mayor Mendenhall, Salt Lake City Police Department Chief Mike Brown, the Salt Lake City Council, the Racial Equity in Policing Commission, and most importantly, you listening and watching us from wherever you are. We'll get to your comments here in just a moment. For those who already know that they wanna speak uh, as part of our listening session, you can press zero on your touchtone phone and you'll speak to a call screener who will take your information and we'll get you on the air just as quickly as we can. All right, we're gonna go on to our next uh, poll question. This is a, a general question. What would you say your experiences have been like with police in Salt Lake City? What would you say your experiences have been like with police in Salt Lake City? For phone callers, if they were great, please press one. If they were okay, please press two. And if they were bad, please press three. And if you haven't had any interactions with police, please press four. Once again, great in terms of your experiences with police in Salt Lake City, please press one. Okay, please press two. Bad, please press three. Or if you haven't had any interactions with police, please press four. And certainly these are questions that get asked, I know, more than once a year. They're frequently uh, interested in knowing your uh, opinions about the department's uh, performance, but this is a helpful check-in. Once again, if you're listening on the phone, in general, what have your experiences been like with police in Salt Lake City? If the answer is great, <laughs> press one. If it's okay, please press two. If it's bad, please press three. And if you haven't had any interactions with police, please press four. For folks who are watching on Facebook Live, we welcome you. You can provide responses via phone or text as well. That's the easiest way for us to work you in to uh, the conversation. So welcome if you're joining us on Facebook Live or on SLC TV or listening to us by phone. All right, we've got a lot of good responses uh, to that question. So I'm gonna go ahead and move to our next question. 
SOCPD officers should have better training in which area? SOCPD officers should have better training in which of the following areas? If you think it's cultural competency or implicit bias, please press one if you're listening on the phone. If it's crisis intervention, please press two. If it's community interaction, please press three. If it's firearms, please press four. Or if it's something else, please press five. Once again, those choices for phone callers. It's most important that SLCPD officers get better training in which of the following. Cultural competency or implicit bias, press one. Crisis intervention, press two. Community interaction, please press three. Firearms, please press four. Or other, please press five. I want to just remind those of you who are listening by phone, we're going to be taking callers live on the air. If you'd like to join us, please press zero. If you can hear me on the phone, you'll speak to a call screener, and then we're going to get to your comments uh, just as quickly as we can. All right, we're going to move to the uh, next question. We've only got, I think, one or two more questions here left before we get to callers. What might SLCPD do to better recruit officers from all backgrounds? What might SLCPD do to better recruit officers from all backgrounds? For our callers, if you would say stronger outreach, please press one. If you would say better pay and benefits, please press two. If you would say a more welcoming culture, please press three. Or if you would say other, please press four. Once again, the question for the phone callers, what might SLCPD do to better recruit officers from all backgrounds? If it's stronger outreach, press one. If it's better pay and benefits, please press two. If it's a more welcoming culture, please press three. Or if it's other, please press four. And this applies to um, all kinds of diversity um, metrics, if you will, including race and ethnicity, age, uh, gender, uh, sexual orientation, you name it. So please think about this in as broad a context as you can. All right, we are getting a robust number of responses from the, the community to these poll questions, and we really appreciate it. I'm going to let you know that for those who have been texting or using the web, we would love to hear uh, some general comments about your experiences with SLCPD and recommendations for changes in policy, training, school safety, and or officer recruitment. I'm going to take this screen down here uh, in just a moment, but know that you can continue to text us throughout the course of this program. As long as you've logged into Equity SLC, you can continue to send your comments about your experiences with SLCPD by uh, sending text messages, or if you're online at polyv.com forward slash equity SLC, you will be able to type in your comments and I'll be referencing those comments here as we uh, go along. Well, I mentioned we are joined by a number of very important decision makers uh, here in our community. I wanna first recognize the Racial Equity in Policing Commission. Maybe if commissioners who are on video can, can wave just so they, uh, the public can, can see and know uh, who you are. We have uh, Commissioner Benuri, Commissioner Eldridge, Commissioner Hawkins, Commissioner uh, Johnson, Commissioner Kaili, Commissioner Coombe, Commissioner McDonald, Commissioner Sagato Malga, Commissioner Salazar Hall, uh, Commissioner Prospero, I know also is with us. Um, I'm sure I may have missed one commissioner. Commissioner, uh, uh, we have a number of commissioners with us. Commissioner Smith also, I'm sorry, I didn't see you there at first. Um, so we have a, a number of our members of the Racial Equity and Policing Commission with us, and we're very happy to have you. Also joining us tonight is Mayor Aaron Mendenhall, uh, who helped to initiate this Racial Equity in Policing Commission. And we have, of course, Salt Lake City Police Department Chief Mike Brown. Chief Brown, thank you for uh, being with us. Also joining us tonight are members of the Salt Lake City Council. I can see Council Chair Amy Fowler. Uh, I can see Council Member Chris Wharton. I believe we have Council Member Andrew Johnston, uh, Council Member Dan Dugan, and I don't know if I have any other council members at this point, but we want to thank all of you for being a part of our uh, program tonight. I'm going to uh, just ask for Chief Brown uh, before we take our first caller, if you could, sir, uh, maybe just share with us something you're hoping to learn from the community uh, over the course of this evening. Thank you, Larry. Um, well, first, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for the invitation. 
I want to, I, I really want to listen and I want to learn what, uh, what changes, what, um, what our community uh, would like to see from their police department. And I sit here as the chief uh, to learn and to understand. Most people listen with the intent, uh, most people do not listen with the intent to understand, but they listen with the intent to reply. And I want you to know I'm sitting here tonight uh, to understand. So please, uh, as, as your comments come out, I, 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 I want you to know I'm committed to this process and, and I'm very thankful for the opportunity to hear from you. So Larry, thank you very much. Pleasure, Chief. Uh, Mayor Mendenhall, for you as well, what, what are you most hoping to glean? Uh, well, like the Chief, I'm, I'm here to listen. It's been a learning experience every single day, um, not just being the mayor, but in particular since uh, May 30th. And I'm getting um, quite comfortable with the vulnerability of uh, not knowing everything and being willing every day to listen and learn anew and rethink the status quo as we've operated um, and even through our decision making. So I'm hoping to hear more that will inform my heart and my mind. And I want to just reiterate that this is a, a safe space and it takes a lot of courage and vulnerability to come to this conversation as the public we um i want to also say that we that you are absolutely critical to this and the commission commission on racial equity and policing i know believe so as well and the work that they're doing is not work that's going to go in a binder on a shelf and and do nothing this is work um, that the city council um, in my office asked from the bottom of our hearts uh, to have the community members do. So we are um, anxiously engaged in the learning process from the commission. And tonight we're here to learn from you. Thank you so much, Mayor. Um, if I could, Council Chair Fowler, I don't know if you wanted to just share what you and the council, I know it's hard to speak for all of the council, but maybe a couple of things you'd like to, to learn. Thank you so much, um, Larry, and thank you to the commission for the work that you're doing and for hosting this very important uh, public engagement piece of, of what we're, the work that you are doing. And thank you also for inviting us and allowing us to be here. Um, as the community and as everybody knows, the council is sort of in charge of, sorry, that's my dog. <laughs> that's um, okay, COVID. <laughs> the council is in charge of making policies. And we want to be sure that we're listening to the policies, to the, to the input of the community so that we can make good policies. Um, it has been a goal, I think, since I've been on the council at least, and I can only speak for myself, but my experience with the council is that we want to make sure that we're meeting the needs of the community. And this is one of those needs and something that's been a long time coming. And I want to listen and make sure that we are creating good policy based on what the community needs. Thank you so much, uh, Council Chair Fowler. And uh, for the commissioners, um, I, I know it's hard to, there isn't a single uh, chair of the commission. And so I would just invite any commissioner who wanted to share what they're hoping to learn tonight to just unmute and, and share that with us. Um, I'd like to speak. Please. Uh, just just um, what the public would like to um, receive from this commission. That's really all I want to know is what is the public expecting from the commission? Thank you so much, Commissioner. We, we appreciate it. I'm sorry. Uh, I just wanted to, to add, um, kind of speaking from the, the youth subcommittee, perspective if there's anyone any young person out there listening or if there's someone listening who knows a young person please uh have them have them speak up um i i think it goes without saying that uh, a lot of the issues that we're, we're trying to address they affect um people of all ages um and and so I, I think one thing that I'm hoping is that um, people, people of the younger generations will, will feel 
um, empowered to speak about their experiences um, and just know that the the sharing of our experiences is what pushes this work forward. Thank you so much, Commissioner Kuhl. I'm not supposed to play favorites as a facilitator, but I have a special place in my heart for the work that you and Commissioner Powell and the Youth Subcommittee have brought to this work. Uh, it's really extraordinary, and we thank you. Um, any other commissioners want to share before we get to our first call? All right. I also, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner McDonald, please. I just wanted to just say we're not learning if we're not listening. So this is an opportunity for us to, to listen and to learn. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing from everyone that has been impacted by everything that brought us here tonight. So I'm looking forward to learning. Thank you so much, Commissioner McDonald. I also neglected to mention my colleague, Dante James. Uh, he and I, along with others at the Langdon Group, have been facilitating the racial uh, equity uh, Racial Equity and Policing Commission, and it's my honor to share the, the evening with him as well. Uh, as I get ready to take our first callers, first of all, I just want to make sure that those who are on the phone know that they can press zero and speak to a screener and we'll get you into the queue. Uh, we do have quite a number in the queue right now, over a dozen, so I'm looking forward to starting. Um, for those who are watching and want to speak, please call us at 1-888-410-3427 or in Espanol, ocho cuatro cuatro, ocho ocho uno, uno tres, uno siete. Hope I got that right. Um, and uh, if you want to, you can also text your comments and we'll be reading those uh, off, the, uh, off the text feed here in just a moment. The first caller that I'd like to take uh, is calling from Salt Lake City. And this is Michael William Fisher, who's been standing by. Uh, Michael. Yes. You're, you're on yeah, there. I would like to. Um, I would like to uh, share because I always help out um, with the community and the police department and um, with different issues going on. And um, there's been a lot of issues. Um, people or the officers or didn't take me seriously. Um, I've reported there's a young woman uh, missing. Her name was Elizabeth Santiago, um, and uh, she was found passed away on the side of the road in Provo. Um, this was probably a year or two ago and, um, I seen her in Salt Lake city, uh, numerous of times, um, when she was missing, I bring her picture into the channel two news and the channel two news told me, um, that she was with her boyfriend and I was also a security officer at the time I was working mm -hmm. three jobs, but I still went in there and I was kind of upset, um, cause probably police called me, it was, maybe a month later or two months later and told me that they found her um, deceased and that they didn't have enough leads. But, um, I also gave, um, when I seen her, I gave direct address, um, vehicle license plate number and everything. Um, so I just feel that, um, each lead that's given, um, for anyone helping, they should, people should take it uh, seriously. Sure. And, so that's not the only issue. Uh, there's been a lot of issues where I live at. Um, where, what part of Salt Lake be, City do you? What part of Salt Lake City are you in? Well, I live in uh, 235 South, 200 East, um, right by the small courthouse here. Okay. And uh, and uh, there's been a lot of issues. People trying to break in my apartment, and um, I've reported so many different times over. And I've lived here eight or about eight years, and for a while, things were ignored. Um, you know, I'm not from here. I'm originally from Illinois. Uh -huh. So I don't know. It's just because I have long hair and tattoos. But I also just took custody of my little girl. And um, I don't know if people just don't like me because I'm a single dad or what. But I think everyone that's helping should be taken seriously because it could be someone's life. I'm or, sure that. Or even if it's a car accident or et cetera, because I also help with two car accidents just last month hmm. over by and, Liberty Park and, and the police. And, and Michael, given that you've got an audience here with, with Chief Brown, with the mayor, with the commission, um, what would you suggest that, that they do differently to address the concerns you've brought up here? Well, I think um, the police department should respond immediately um, and get out to the address where 
there's an issue. Like if I've seen her say over at 200 South and, um, no, uh, like say it's the 385 address, you know, they need, they should go out there immediately instead of waiting. Um, because if she's not found and she's missing, somebody should get out there and see if that's her. Um, that's not the only time that I reported it. Like I said, I also seen her over by the train tracks. No, Willow. Well, we, we um, I just think every, every, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. I just think it should be, um, quicker. I think people should um, respond quicker online and getting it to the, to the officers so they can, um, help them or if there's an issue. Thank you so much. When uh, you call in, when when you call in, sometimes they stall and they're like, you know, it needs to be quicker because it could, it could be someone's life. Well, Michael, thank you for taking the opportunity to give us this uh, detailed story. And um, as we as we say goodbye to you, thanks for calling. I, I just wanted to share with everyone who is going to speak tonight that um, we really are focused on listening as opposed to an extended um, back and forth uh, between callers and the and the leadership tonight. So there may be those of you who want to get your uh, questions answered, and I will tell you we will record all of the questions that you ask. Uh, but we are going to focus primarily on comments similar to Michael's, where you've got a story to tell, you've got a suggestion, uh, you've got something you want the uh, leadership of the city uh, to hear. The next caller we're going to go to is Beverly in Salt Lake City. And uh, Beverly, if you're there, uh, you're on the air, please go ahead. Thank you very much. I appreciate this opportunity to speak with you. I've been observing the full and subcommittee commission meetings from the beginning and I'm so impressed with all the work you're doing. The issues being researched and discussed seem to be thorough with one possible exception. I've heard very little about the role that police unions play in how law enforcement might respond to changes in uh, recruitment, training, policies, procedures, and retention. I recognize the sensitivity of the relationship between police unions and law enforcement administration, and I respect the role that unions have to play. It may be though that problems we've heard about in other jurisdictions don't apply here in Salt Lake, but I do think it merits attention from the commission. It seems that the balance of power or influence has tipped too far regarding procedural rights to the benefit of the union members. I hope that the commission might also look into the role that police unions play in addressing your work towards racial equity. And I hope the police officers and union leaders can see this not as an attack on them, but as a part of the effort to make the SLCPD one of the best departments, excuse me, best departments in the nation, one we can all be proud of with no reservations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Beverly, very much. And I, I know that we have, as a part of the commission process, been having conversations with frontline officers who are members of the, the public safety union, and that work uh, certainly should. Uh, continue in terms of having their voice uh, as part of this uh, conversation and and let it not go unsaid that if there are officers who would like to share their own perspective, uh, it is okay to do that as well. You can press zero uh, after you've called in and and speak, or you can send a text. Again, that's equity SLC, the text message to 22333. And then once you've done that, you can send a new text with your uh, comments. Our next uh, caller is going to be uh, Virginia Kinlock. I hope I've said that name correctly. She's also in Salt Lake City. Virginia, if you're there, please go ahead. Yes. C- can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Oh, thank you. Um, I appreciate you giving me a chance to be um, able to speak. Um, I'm, what my my thing is, I would like to see more reform uh, and uh, when hiring um more detailed information as to the person who wants to become a police officer. Um, it's this is a lifestyle, and it's a it's not just a job to make some money, but it is looking out for people. I have most of my family members have been in law enforcement. Um, I myself has been uh, parking enforcement downtown, but I actually still had a interest in the people that I'm serving. I looked at it as a servant, which I'm now um, disabled due to an accident where a lady ran a red light. But I would like to see them because I've had incidents 
um, last last year, and then now again this year, well, the t- the thirtieth of the month of December. Um, there was two incidents that happened, but one was handled differently, um, and it, it affected me. I was the victim in both cases. And what, was the, what, was was the difference in, it, what was the difference in how they were handled? The difference was it took a whole year for them to uh, put a an order that I had had for over a year that I received from the D- district attorney's office when the person would continuously bother me for a whole year and they would do nothing about it. I ended up on top of my medical issues that I already had. I ended up with something called functional neurologic disease, which means when my blood pressure goes up, I have tiny blood vessels popping in my head. I'm and sorry, it's that. actually causing me, it's like you have symptoms of a stroke. So then I have to come back each time and I have PS. PTSD from this. The difference is that happened. They took them a whole year. My grandson, who lives, well, who was living in the same building, has uh, schizophrenia, functional schizophrenia. They took him to jail immediately. I have raised, took my time and raised, helped raise this boy from a child, from a baby. He's 32 years old now, and they. They need to come together on what's supposed to be done. The crisis line said they couldn't take him. We've called several times. The crisis line said they couldn't do anything unless he harmed himself or someone. Well, I ended up being the person, and I had to go to the hospital. And when I got back, they had taken him to jail and not gotten him to the – where he needed to be was to the hospital to get his injection and to go to be um, – what's the word, um, to be treated, to be checked over and to be right. evaluated right. again. And well, I would like to see them Go the ahead. same thing, you know, everybody know, doing the same thing and have the same response. Not one person telling you one thing and another person telling you something else and they do something else. Thank you so Education much. Education I, 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 uh, I am sorry, first of all, that uh, for all that you have uh, been through and that your family has been through, your, your input, though, and you're telling us of your story is, is very helpful, and I can uh, tell that the chief is, is taking information, uh, and I know that we uh, have the attention of the entire commission and the city leadership, so I want to thank you for calling. I'm going to shortly go to uh, another caller. I just wanted to briefly show our uh, attendees that we do have some uh, text messages uh, coming in, and I'll be uh, sharing these in their entirety with our group. I'll, I'll do my best to to uh, come back to the screen uh, periodically. Again, if you'd like to post a comment rather than speaking, you can either go to pollev.com forward slash equity SLC and type in a comment. Or if you've already texted equity SLC to the phone number 22333, then you can place a text message uh, with your comment. All of those are of course uh, anonymous. Uh, we will go back to the phones. We have a, a number of folks who are uh, standing by, and I have uh, Amy on the line who says she is the chair of the Ballpark Community Council. So, Amy, if you're there, please go ahead. Oh, thank you so much for your time this evening. You're welcome. Uh, my question is sort of a question, and thank you. My question is sort of a question and comment, and I know a great concern within the Salt Lake Police Department is the reduction of staffing numbers we've seen this year, the officers who've left the force, and what I've heard many officers call a mass exodus. I wanna know about what efforts that the Salt Lake Police Department or the city has made to understand why have our public servants left? Beyond the exit interviews by their peers, I wonder if the city would consider hiring an outside third party professional entity to interview those employees who've left the department to determine why. Mm -hmm. And I'm asking because I know this must affect recruitment and retention, but also if we don't understand why this happened, then we can only expect this problem to repeat itself at another time, an extremely difficult time in history when we need our public safety servants the most. And, um, Can I, can I ask you before I let you go, um, you mentioned a third party. Is there a, is there a kind of a, a profile of what you'd want that third party to be? Is it a human resources consultant? Is it a law firm? What, what are you thinking there? Oh, I think probably something along the lines of human resources, but I have to admit, 
I'm outside my area of expertise okay. here, and I'm sure there are people who could make better can, better decisions than myself, but but thank you for asking. Oh, of course. Well, thank you for the call very much. Um, that was Amy calling us, and we are going to uh, go next to Lou. And I believe that uh, Lou is a Salt Lake City resident and uh, has, a, has a perspective to share with us. Lou, please go ahead. You're on the air. Lou, if you can hear me, you're on the air. We'd love to hear from you. I will share what I was told by our call screener, which is that um, he identified as someone who is disabled and autistic and experienced police intimidation. What is the city and the department willing to do for individuals who have dealt with uh, ignorance with police officers um, how do you intend to rectify this and make sure officers will enforce and support public health and safety mandates? What about ones who don't follow or humiliate others? So I'm sorry we couldn't hear from Lou. Perhaps uh, if you can hear me, you can call us back, press zero, and then we'll try to get you back on the air. But that was the comment that he gave to the call screener. And we'll see if we can get him back uh, here in just a minute. Again, if you're just joining us, this is the Racial Equity and Policing Commission's Community Listening Session. I'm Larry Schooler, joined by Mayor Aaron Mendenhall, Chief Mike Brown of the Police Department, the members of the Racial Equity and Policing Commission, the members of the Salt Lake City Council, my colleague Dante James, and most importantly, you listening to us as the members of the community. We are here to listen to you. So if you'd like to join us by phone, you can call us 888-410-3427. And then once you're on the line, press zero and you'll speak to a call screener and we'll get your comment uh, live on the air. And then uh, you can also text us, Equity SLC, send that text to 22333. And then after that text has gone through, you can uh, post. We have a caller who would like to uh, remain anonymous, I was told, um, but we'd like to take her uh, live right now. Uh, Ma'am, if you're there, please go ahead. Oh, hi there. Thank you for talking with me or letting me talk. Um, I just want to, I want to say how much I appreciate the police department. Um, I don't know what I would do without you at all. Um, in my life, there's been many times that I've had to call you for different things. And each time you've been respectful and you've helped me a lot. Um, some of the times were three times last year I had to call the police on my own son um, and I was really thankful that the police were patient and did not overreact um, where anybody got harmed or anything they were just they were wonderful and I really appreciate it and I also want to say that I really believe that when kids run away from home, that the police needs to always go try to find them immediately or keep looking until they find them. Um, anyway, I, I thank the police department for helping me all through the years. It takes a lot of courage to share a story like that, ma'am. And I want to thank you very much for doing so. I, I can imagine, I cannot imagine actually what it might have been like for you to have to call uh, the police about your own uh, son. But I appreciate uh, your perspective and sharing that story uh, with us. I'm actually going to, um, wait, can I'm, we, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, ma'am, can we maybe have like talk with you offline to figure out what it was that law enforcement did right in that interaction with your son? Um, I know that's something that is uh, mental health is something that's near and dear to my heart. And I want to make sure that if we are, if law enforcement is doing something right, what is it? And what they were just really that? patient, asked questions. Hey, what's the matter? What are you doing? They didn't just, you know, they weren't scared of him or anything, which I'm so thankful because um, he's a good kid. But he was drinking and, you know, how the drinking affects people. Um, but the police, uh, <laughs> I'm just so thankful for them. 
Well, would you be willing to talk with us offline so we can maybe get some particulars and if, if we can identify specific officers that worked on, on that uh, interaction or those interactions? Maybe we can sure. Um, what do you want me to do? Call no. you back? Or? We, we've got we've got uh, your information, and I'll be sure to connect you. Um, uh, we'll, we'll connect the commission to you uh, later on. Um, we we'll want to protect your anonymity for right now. But um, thank you so much again for calling. I'll tell you, my name is thank Diane. You. Thank you. Diane. All right. Thanks, thank Diane. you. Um, I, that was, by the way, Commissioner uh, Salazar Hall from the Racial Equity and Policing Commission. Um, that was uh, Diane, as I mentioned. Uh, she had asked to be anonymous, but uh, she did give her name there uh, towards the end. Just as a reminder to the mayor, the police chief, the council, and the commissioners, at any point, if you want to uh, follow up with a caller the way Commissioner Salazar Hall did, please just go right ahead and, and do so. Um, it's hard for me to know who all wants to speak, so please uh, don't hesitate. Uh, my folks tell me that Lou may have uh, come back to uh, join us and I want to see if it's possible for us to hear from Lou. I understand that uh, she had stepped away for a moment. Uh, so Lou, um, if you're there and can hear me, please go ahead. This is Lou. I'm one of the executive board members of DRAC, the Disability Rights Action Committee, and my pronouns are they, them. And I do want us to recognize that we are on occupied indigenous land. <clears throat> Uh, I also wanted to ask a clarifying question before my final question, because as someone who's autistic and cutie BIPOC, um, Nate, this is such small lake city. I get names very confused. Hello, Darlene. Love you, doll. Um, comrades. But I need to know who is the, uh, the female supervisor of internal affairs? Um, because I have a um, a very positive message about them, um, but I also have feedback about their subordinate and their use of a conspiratorial medical theory. Lou, can you can you, can, can you concisely problems. can you concisely with us right now share some of that feedback? We'd we'd like to have it. Right. Well, I need to first, I'd like to know who it is that I address, because I don't remember their name specifically, but she was a female supervisor of internal affairs. And, um, I'm, sure, and I'm sure Chief Brown can identify that person, uh, you know, after after we're through here. But is there feedback you can share about the experience? Right. Um, uh, she seemed to be, first off, willing to listen to me. Um, one of the uh, a member of the agency that um, has actually taken their time to unpack their white privilege and do some sincere anti-racial internal work, um, read literature that I wouldn't have presumed that they were aware of, like um, white fragility and some of the other ones, and even were able to have a dialogue about recommending other um, more protracted literature and curriculum that they could continue in their process to decolonize um, her department. Um, her immediate subordinate, however, when I have, because I was calling about a specific incident that happened, which um, I'll uh, recall here in, in a moment, but when I brought up my concerns about my safety, and the fact that um, I am an immunocompromised member of the public, I'm autistic, and I'm physically disabled, um, I was gaslit. Uh, DARVO tactic was used against me. Can you, and can you share more about what that can you share more? Being, I'm sorry to cut well, you off. DARVO obviously. tactic is a way to deflect. Yes. Um, I would like for others to write this down so I'm not continuously having to contribute emotional currency to um, become more trauma informed because y'all have a position of privilege I don't have. So I would appreciate if those that are listening would write this down and become familiar with something that is a part of policing culture that is often used to intimidate femme bodies and people that are perceived as femme in in a way that I personally have experienced many times with physical intimidation. 
I, I can't I hear you. I appreciate that clarification. Yeah, we, we've got you. Um, is there anything else you wanted to add uh, for now? And, and we can follow up also with you. Uh, oh, absolutely. There's three different incidences that I feel like need to be um, um, conveyed. OK, uh, I'll, ask you, to, I'll ask you to be ago. a little bit. I'll ask you to be a little bit brief just because we have about a dozen callers waiting. I will. I, I, I intend to be sure. I understand that. My first experience that was negative with a run in with um, police officers was during the um, action that was called Take Shelter Coalition. When I informed your officers that I was light sensitive and also autistic, not only did they. I can hear that you're wanting to interject because you're ahead and you're behind on the video. No, ma'am, we're, we're listening. I'm sorry. So are you still listening? That Yes, we sure okay, are. Sorry about that. This is going to be a little confusing for me. Yeah. How, and when I told them that I had um, this issue with being light sensitive, not only did they flash their side beams onto me from the truck that they were driving, but one of the officers began to use a flashlight to make um, almost like a strobe light effect, um, which caused me to have a petit mal seizure. Another moment that I had was not too not too long ago, where um, I was trying to help a member of the unsheltered community and was approached by a member of the Salt Lake Police Department and told that if I interfere with the investigation, which I was just trying to get them up off the floor, um, because I saw a police officer coming and didn't want them to be feel intimidated. And my last one was just recently where one of your police officers got into my personal space, not wearing an appropriate mask that would actually keep me safe, and then proceeded to tell me how much he was proud of being an asshole and that he very much enjoys being an asshole oh, and I, enjoys I apologize. treating I apologize. others. I apologize for having to interrupt. Obviously, um, because we're on live television, it's important that we uh, stay away from, uh, you know, profanity. Um, I, I really appreciate your sharing these experiences, though. The detail is very important. The specifics are very important. We thank you for that call, and uh, we will do our best to follow up with you. We appreciate you letting us know uh, more about uh, yourself. Uh, so again, Lou, thanks for the call. I'm going to go to uh, Andrew in Salt Lake City. Again, for those who are still hoping to join us uh, on the air, you can call us at 888-410-3427. Again, 888-410-3427. And then you can press zero and you'll speak to a call screener and you'll get on the air. Um, you can also text to 22333. If you haven't texted yet tonight, use Equity SLC as your first message, hit send, and then you'll be able to text. And we are getting quite a few uh, texts, so I'll be um, looking forward to sharing those as well. Uh, also, pollev.com forward slash equity SLC. That's pollev.com forward slash equity SLC. All right, we will go to Andrew in Salt Lake City. And Andrew, you're on the line and live on the air. Uh, thank you very much. Good, e good evening, commission members. The Disability Law Center uh, Center is here because an estimated 40% of Utah shot by police in, in 2020 were reportedly experiencing a mental health event. One fourth of students arrested and three and three quarters of, of JJS involved youth have a disability. The DLC is grateful for the RETC's focus on training, particularly its emphasis on de-escalation and crisis intervention. However, we share concern regarding some of the police department's responses to commissioners' questions. The Commission on 21st Century Policing recommends seeking officer candidates who've had positive interactions with people of various cultural, cultural backgrounds. The School Safety Subcommittee recommends law enforcement collect and report contact and outcome data disaggregated by a variety of, dis, by a variety of demographic categories. SLCPD should also consider, uh, sh should also ensure equitable language access, including alternative means of communication for all who encounter police or enter the criminal justice system. And, Additionally, and when you say, um, excuse list. me for interrupting you, Andrew, when you say alternative means of communication, sure, right? can you can you share with us a little more about what that might look like? Um, I mean, 
um, American Sign Language for folks with for folks who have um, intellectual disabilities, uh, perhaps using cards with pic cards with pictures on them. Uh, other other alternatives besides uh, besides verbal and English. And of right. course, and of course, for folks who are visually impaired, uh, Braille would be an important option as well. Very good. Um, is there anything else you wanted to mention before we move on to another call? You've given us such great feedback, and I know you've been at our meetings, so uh, we, we love hearing from you. Yeah. And I um, I just wanted uh, to remind the to remind the commission that we were uh, that we were asked to. I uh, share this information with you tonight, but that you do uh, that you do have our full um, our full comments uh, that you can uh, look through at your leisure, and we look forward to continuing continuing to work together to, as the process continues. Andrew, again, thank you so much. The the detailed information you've been giving this commission for several months now has has been very much appreciated. Um, Commissioners, Mayor and Chief I, and the City Council, um, I just want to check in with you. Um, we are about eight minutes before the hour and we have about 10 callers left in the speaker queue. So I just wanted to get a signal that you'd like us to, to stay on uh, long enough to get to all of the callers that are in the queue. Great. Um, so I'm going to go next to a caller who has given her name as Ma Black. Um, Ma, uh, I assume that's your first name. I don't know, but uh, please, you're on the air. Please go ahead. Thank you so much for your time. Um, it is very wonderful to see of the people that I admire and love and respect being part of this commission. Thank you so much for creating this spaces. Um, my question is to our chief, Mike Brown, and our mayor, uh, Mendenhall. What are the steps or the precautions that both of your departments are taking in order to secure our safety? I was doxxed by a white supremacist around three weeks ago, and I would like to know what are the steps that um, are going to be implemented in the future to make sure that communities of color, particularly the women of color, um, actively using our first constitutional right, which is peaceful protest, we feel safe in this city. That's my question. We really appreciate um, you calling. And um, as I mentioned at the top of the hour, we will do our best to get questions answered um, as best we can after uh, the program in the coming days. And we have your information and we'll be sure to uh, follow up with you. But I'm sorry for the experience that you had. I'm sure that was uh, deeply traumatic. Uh, I was asked to give the number one more time. Uh, the telephone number to call in is 888-410-3427. That's 888-410-3427. In Espanol, 844-881-1317 for Spanish speakers. And again, you can text Equity SLC to the phone number 22333. And then after that text goes through, you can text your comments to us or go to pollev.com forward slash equity SLC. All right. Uh, another uh, interesting caller coming on here, uh, I believe, is Angela Kenda, who calls from South Salt Lake. Angela, please, you're on the air. Uh, yeah. Um, I never really had a run in with the police and I appreciate everything that police does and I appreciate everything Mayor Mendehall does and everybody else. I think you're doing a great job. I just see that there's a lack of a lack of accountability on the police side. We have a lot of laws and regulations set up for offenders of like the break the law and criminals that break the law, but we don't have a lot of accountability on the other side. We have a lot of protections on the other side and lack of accountability. And I know you're doing your best to screen people so that the bad apples don't get through because certain professions just shouldn't have bad apples, but bad apples are, you know, likely to get through. It just happens. But when those bad apples get through, I feel they get protected and there's no accountability held on the officer side versus the criminal side. Do you have thanks for what you do? Yeah, Angela, before we let you go, do you have particular suggestions yeah. 
about what that accountability, how that accountability should be carried out, how, what, what that should look like? Um, yeah, like I myself am a doctor, so I go through the Department of Professional Licensing. Is there the way that like, you know, those officers can go through like a same kind of protocol that they, they go through like professional licensing or something. And if there is a complaint against them, then that goes through that professional licensing. It's also made public. That would be a great option because, you know, if I hurt a patient or if I do something that gets reported directly back to Doppel and the fact that like I'm held accountable for my bad actions, but the people protecting us kind of get to skate is upsetting. I hear what you're saying. Thank you for that uh, concrete uh, example. And thanks for calling. Appreciate it. Um, yeah. Right. All right. We're going to turn to Matthew next. Matthew's been holding for a while. I appreciate your patience, as have our other callers. So thank you all for your patience. Uh, Matthew, go ahead, please. Hi there. Thank you for this uh, opportunity. And uh, I just have to say I received this call in, inwards and I appreciate the um, proactive measures that you're all taking to reach out to the uh, community. I'm very uh, appreciative of that. Uh, Mayor Mendenhall, uh, you and I roamed the halls of Alta High School once upon a time. I was a year older than you, but uh, I'm, I never I never remember seeing you. But anyway, I don't mean to digress. <laughs> anyway, I work for, uh, I, I'm not going to, because I'm not authorized to represent, but I work for an agency that uh, works with refugees in the state of Utah. And um, one of the things that I have really endeavored to try to do is get more refugees into policing or former refugees that have gained their citizenship. And I would love, uh, like we've done with Department of, uh, or, uh, uh, Department of Public Safety, I would love to form a better collaboration with us doing the heavy lifting if necessary to um, create some kind of pathway to get refugees uh, policing their own communities. And I would love uh, this commission, um, when we're talking about, you know, looking at the surveys and the questions that were asked uh, and at the beginning of this, figure out a way that we can get more people that look like the people in their communities policing their communities. And I would love this commission to work with us on, on building a program that we can get end post and academy training um, available to more people uh, that are from and live within those communities. Matthew, thank you very much. And, and uh, just to uh, clarify what Matthew was saying, we did do a dial out for tonight's meeting. So some of you may have joined us uh, without planning on it. And we really appreciate that uh, Matthew was one of those folks who has joined us uh, tonight. We've gotten a number of comments on Facebook Live that I've, I've seen come through and I, I just wanted to read one of them. Um, and I might be asking my team to, to put some of them back up here for me. Um, but one of them was from Ralph Misa. He says, Utah historically failed to politically fund ongoing police enforcement data. What is the commission doing about the collection of law enforcement data? And without getting too deeply into it, uh, that's certainly been a topic of conversation, uh, both at the subcommittee level of the commission and the full commission. So I know that that uh, comment is uh, falling on live ears, uh, Ralph. So appreciate that. For those who really would like to get their comments heard, please join us on the phone or via text message, but we also uh, will try to get to as many of the the Facebook comments as we uh, can. I'm going to try to go to Rosio now, and apologies if I mispronounced that, uh, but Rosio has joined us from uh, Salt Lake City, and, and Rosio, if you're there, please go ahead. Hi, uh, it's Rosio. I I'm so sorry, forgive me. Um, no worries, my friend. Um, so I'm calling to tell you a story. Um, I moved here from a different country. I lived in a big city. I never had to drive. I am 35 years old. I still do not have a driver's license and it is because of my fear of the police force. There is no way that as an immigrant, I'm going to feel comfortable being pulled over by police. I have a graduate degree. I've been here almost 10 years and I still do not have a driver's license and this is the reason why. Now, coming from where I come from, we like gun culture is not really 
our jam. Um, and so I came here and I was like, you know what? I'm going to be an engaged citizen and I'm going to join the Citizens Academy, the last Citizens Academy that took place in the Poplar Grove precinct, my precinct. I attended with two other people of color. One of them is a current commissioner. And um, we were subjected to really uncomfortable comments by our peers that the two officers that ran the training did not have the ability to manage. And secondly, they showed us videos of folks of color getting shot in a jovial manner so much so that we had to walk out of the room. So I don't know how aware you are of um, the curriculum of the Citizens Academy and the way that it takes place in real life, but I can definitely tell you that I left that training absolutely terrorized that that could be me and that my friends that attended uh, felt the same way. And so still license free, taking the bus and walking. And what I was hoping would be a positive experience in trying to really go to that uncomfortable place for me made me even more scared um which then just turned into just absolute terror when a child was shot two houses down from me we were told we were going to get victim services in our neighborhood for the neighbors that had to witness it all and this never happened um so i just want to put it out there i think like some folks of um focus on different angles, but this is something that you definitely have um, power and agency over. And I just want to tell you, I do not want to live in fear anymore. Also, I'd rather be able to drive because it's cold here, man. <laughs> well, that, oh, yes, Council, Council Councilman Fowler. Thank you. Thank you. Um, could we offline get some information about the victim services that was just mentioned? Um, I'd love to make sure that we follow up on, on what was told and what isn't being done. Um, and so obviously it sounds like a sensitive situation, but if we could maybe get some offline information about that, I'd be greatly appreciative. We will have a way to get back with Rocio uh, after the meeting, and, and we will endeavor to do so. Thank you, uh, Rocio, for the call. I, I'm, I'm sure it was extremely disappointing to go through that experience, the, both of those experiences, and we appreciate the courage it took for you to share them. Quickly, I want to mention a couple of Facebook comments. Peter Brownstein wrote, I am appreciative of all the work being done here in Salt Lake City to address these challenges. I'm fairly certain that other cities share these are there any best practices that are being used elsewhere in the nation with positive results? Have any efforts been made to find these? And then a comment from Charles Henderson, uh, similar to a comment we heard on the phone. I'd like to hear more about the role police unions have in addressing these obvious community concerns. I understand they represent police officers, but where is the accountability and alignment of representations, policy, accountability, as well as training? to mitigate the issues and concerns shared by the community seems a bit lopsided when it comes to the actions and the perceived mission of community service. As I mentioned, we're going a little past uh, seven o'clock tonight to make sure that we get to uh, just about as, as many calls as we can. Uh, I show uh, just under a dozen calls uh, still in the queue. Let me go first to uh, Milo Anderson. Milo is uh, calling uh, and Milo, if you're there, please go ahead. Hi. Milo, are you okay? Are you okay to share with us? Yes. Sorry, my voice gets a little shaky. That's okay. Please go ahead. All right. So I have a few a few questions. The first one I'd like to start with is, um, what have the police done to ensure there isn't another situation like the dairy and hunt one a few years ago? Share with us, if you could, some other uh, questions you'd like to get answered. Okay. The other questions I have are, um, 
Well, at the beginning of the call, there was a poll regarding what, how we would like to see more diversity in the police force. I would like to ask to that question, what purpose would having more diversity in the police force serve if the police are still serving, you know, an oppressive purpose against minority, then a minority being the one serving that purpose wouldn't help, you know, like just because it's a gay person committing police brutality against a black person wouldn't make it any better. Hmm. So um, what would having like diversity do to help the situation? Understand. And is there anything else you'd like to, to pose to the folks listening? Yes. The last question I have is, um, what have the police done to ensure that their police policies aren't unfairly targeted towards homeless people? A lot of the time, homeless people will get arrested for trespassing because they need to use a store's bathroom or they need somewhere to sleep, which is unfair because they're already homeless. So what else are they going to do? A lot of those laws are like punishing them for being homeless, but it's like not something that they have control over. So what do the police do to ensure that they aren't just punishing people for being homeless? Milo, these are excellent uh, questions and uh, issues that you're raising, and I want to thank you for calling. I, I did notice that Commissioner Powell uh, was giving you snaps, and I think that that's a compliment or a sign of support. I'm not necessarily uh, up with all of the, but um, I, I think that that's what he was trying to convey. Uh, we're going to go next to uh, Tora Tonga, who I, whose name I hope I didn't uh, terribly mispronounce. Uh, Tora Tonga, if you're there, please go ahead. Yeah, um, uh, you know, I, the last caller, I, um, you know, I, I have a lot of uh, friends that are homeless, and you know, I, I for one used to be in the downtown area where the oh, uh, homeless center is be on, and and uh, you know, hanging out with the homeless. Community. Uh, that was a big issue because, you know, you were, so you would uh, buy the dogs, places that you weren't supposed to sleep, sleep at, you'd be uh, up at night. And, like, you know, and that's another thing. Also, um, last year, I happened to watch the news and uh, review of a young Latino kid being shot by the, our police department, and you know, to hear that on the news, and um, I don't want to come from a big Polynesian community here in Utah, in uh, in our beloved city of Utah, that is uh, supportive, but on the other hand, I. You know, I for one sometimes feel that the uh, police brutality has gone too far. You know, I, I don't want to create a problem, but I think the police brutality has gone too far. And uh, I just feel that those that go through the academy don't get enough training. So they figure it all enough training and put them out in the force. And not and not keep them in the get the training before they put them out on the force. Right, Tora Tonga. Um, we're going to make sure to um, follow up with you after the meeting. Unfortunately, there were times where your phone connection was difficult for us to hear, and and I regret that. Uh, so we will endeavor to get you back on the phone uh, in the coming days to get additional uh, information from you. It was a little bit hard to make out, but thank you so much for. Uh, calling us uh, tonight. I want to just briefly uh, come to uh, some of the text messages that we've received before I get the remaining uh, callers. Um, folks should be able to, whoop, sorry about that, everybody. Uh, folks should be able to, in just a moment, when I get us back to it, see uh, some of the um, uh, texts that have come in. It's a little bit hard, actually, for me to scroll through these without uh, messing up with the visuals. Um, but you can see that there are a number of comments, and I'll uh, certainly be giving all of these to the um, to the group. So if you have comments and don't have the opportunity to speak tonight, you can text to 22333. Two, two, three, three. That's two twos and three threes. And if you haven't texted yet, just text the phrase equity SLC and hit send, and then you can send your comment uh, anonymously via text message. 
We're going to turn now to a few remaining callers. Uh, let me first go to Catherine Sullivan in the ballpark area. And I know Catherine's been very, very patient. I hope she's still there. Catherine, if you're there, please go ahead. Uh, yes, I uh, live, as you said, in the ballpark area. Our daughter was murdered two years ago, about two and a half years ago, uh, not in our neighborhood, but in a neighborhood near Trolley Square. It was carelessly investigated by the police department, and he was not even arrested until seven months after the actual murder. The apartment was never roped off and declared a crime scene by the police. Um, he was actually brought back over there from the University of Nora Psychiatric Institute a day after the murder and allowed to wander around in the yard while someone was inside getting something of his. The, the whole case was just so poorly handled that when we finally got to the hearings, which would have you know, arraigned him and taken it on to trial, the evidence was so tainted and useless that it was plea bargained down to a manslaughter case. And he's already back out on the street. And I feel like he's a very dangerous young man. He'll be on probation for five years. But after that, I believe he will kill again. Our daughter was a wonderful young woman. She was a graduate of Stanford University. She had lived in the British Isles for 12 years and participated as part of a folk singing group there, had a lot of fans and friends over there, and was still kind of naive as to, you know, people that could harm her. I believe that she had experienced with him some domestic violence throughout their relationship that my husband and I had no awareness of. So we were completely taken by surprise the night that she died. Uh, unfortunately, we were called at the university hospital to be with her the last few hours of her life. It was the same night that this young woman was killed up at the university, the 20th of, of October of uh, 2018. And so our daughter's case didn't appear in the news very much. So a lot of people did not ever hear about it. But uh, she's now buried in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. And her friends, of course, over in the British Isles, they're just beside themselves. They don't understand how she could have left there healthy and vital and happy. And now she's six foot under at the cemetery. And it's hard to explain to them how poorly this case was handled. What bothers me is I feel like the police have gone on to the next case. We met with Sim Gill and we sent many meetings with Colleen McGee and Josh Graves, who were the two prosecutors on the case. But, you know, by the time the evidence is, is twisted and used by the defense and made and the prosecution realizes they don't have a hope of getting a murder charge, it, it's, it just leaves the parents unable to do really anything. And I would like to know that there's some kind of follow up for parents that this happens to in the future or families that this happens to in the future where if the police blow it so much with evidence, for example, they had tracked my daughter's blood all over the apartment. They never declared it a crime scene. They handed him bloody clothing to put on. Of course, it was bloody. He had my daughter's blood all over it. Uh, one of the body cams of the police was turned off for a while. And all of this was used by the defense as a reason to plea bargain it down to a manslaughter charge. And even the judge commented that it was pretty remarkable that uh, it had gotten plea bargained down that far, but it was really because of the evidence and the carelessness with it. Sounds like, I, and uh, I would like to so, know. Yeah, sounds like there were I sort of like two. Sounds like there were sort of two traumas here, Catherine. There was the the trauma associated with losing your daughter, and then the trauma associated with how things played out with the investigation and the prosecution. Absolutely, but I would like to know that there's some sort of retraining for police that are. And I don't think it was done purposely. I think it was just done carelessly, um, partly because he was not arrested that night. He was acting so crazy when the police finally came that he was taken to the University Neuropsychiatric Institute. But the the health should have still been declared a crime scene until it was further investigated, and it was not. So people could go in and out of there um, he was brought back over there to get some things. Who knows if he destroyed more evidence then. I don't believe they ever did find out the tool that he used to strangle our daughter with. They were focusing on this 
red, red netting, but I don't think that was what was used at all when I saw the marks on her neck. So I think because that was just a misguided I, focus. But I would I, like to know that the police are being retrained because they probably don't even hear about what happens to a case once it goes to the prosecutors to even know what they did wrong. So I see that the police chief is there and your group. Um, hopefully he can take what I'm saying and set up some kind of a process where um, police are retrained when something like this happens and, and a case is so poorly followed through on that it isn't even uh, able to be prosecuted. I know he's hearing you, uh, Catherine, right now. I'm, I'm looking at him. And um, again, I want to express how deeply sorry uh, I am for your loss um, and know that we will be following up with you to uh, see what can be done to address the concerns that you have. Thank you very much for calling and for waiting right. I... to speak. We appreciate it. Um, there is a comment from Facebook uh, Bobby N. Belinda Saltiban says, this is a racially diverse commission and it's great. How does it compare with the diversity and leadership in the police departments, city leadership, and mayor's office? Uh, we have a couple more callers, folks. Thanks for staying, uh, uh, hanging in there with me. Jose uh, calling with some comments related to the West Side. Jose, please go ahead. Yes, hello. My name is Jose Borjón. <clears throat> I work in in Salt Lake City, although I live in North Salt Lake. My comment is as a member of the Hispanic community and first uh, recognize the importance of, of the work that is being done, address uh, one of the questions, a member of the commission, what do we expect from them? Pretty much that we can get by the dates uh, established in the mandate, the real, um, recommendations that are feasible that can make a change in the short term and and uh, go beyond uh, more institutionalization of, of commissions, which only uh, continue the uh, uh, a process that can be bureaucratic. So I'm looking forward to seeing results there. As I said, I'm a member of the Hispanic community. I'm actually the, the Mexican consul here in Salt Lake City, and I'm interested in, in hearing what we can do for those Hispanic um, businessmen who have repeatedly tell me that they don't feel that the, the police is responding to their calls, especially those who are in the west side of the city, and how can we make more connections so that uh, all communities, in this case the Hispanic community, can be, um, be part of, of this conversation and, and uh, addressed their immediate needs, which are very important. And, and they're not feeling that when they're calling in, uh, the, the police uh, are not arriving or uh, general situation. So I've heard that repeatedly and I wanted to pass it on. Um, sure. And another issue I'm particularly- I was just gonna say, we really appreciate you sharing uh, that. Go ahead. Okay, is um, the Salt Lake Police a policy manual on, on the chapter on hate crimes. We have uh, two years now, a new uh, target enforcement law, which is a hate crime. And yet, uh, if you review the police uh, manual, its last revision was in March 5th, 2018. So I'd like to see th that manual updated to reflect this new legislation of the state of Utah for the benefit of all. I'll leave it here because I know there's uh, uh, other people in the call and I really appreciate what everybody is doing, especially the leadership in the city, uh, Chief Brown, the Major Menaho and all who are today. Thank you. It's interesting. I've been saying council member this, council member that, and then I have a consul. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much, Jose, for calling and for your service uh, to your country and to our country and for sharing the concerns that you did. That's very valuable. Um, we have uh, a handful of other callers who are sticking with us, and I appreciate it. I'm going to start with uh, Maggie, who I know has several concerns and has been waiting for a little while. Maggie, please go ahead. Hi. First, I'd like to say thank you for taking the time and staying late to listen to all of us. I really do appreciate it. I live in Salt Lake on 7th East. I also work in Salt Lake over on 2nd South. Um, the first thing I'd like to say is we need to be able to depend upon our police force to be there for us 
and help us. We don't need to be in fear of calling them and wondering, will they show up? Are they going to help or are they going to make matters worse? Let me give you an example. As I said, I work on Second South. We have quite the homeless issue over there. We've had several homeless people come in, hide out in our bathrooms or our storerooms. And for instance, I've gone into the women's restroom and had to chase a man out of the women's stall who was in there shooting up. We called the police. Nothing happens. They don't show up. I'm left to chase the man who's shooting up in the bathroom out of our business. We've had to go through this so many times that my boss did not want us to feel unsafe any longer. So he had to install locking mechanisms so no one can come in our doors now unless we buzz them in. Because our police force was not showing up to help us when we called. Second, the police need more training. What happened with these autistic kids, the autistic child being shot should never have happened. There's training available and training should not stop after they graduate the police force. This should be ongoing. Even if it has to be yearly, there needs to be more training involved. There needs to be more training with non-lethal force that should not be your first option if you're in a scary situation that you're not sure how to handle it. That should not be your first option. There needs to be ongoing training constantly. You can contact the Utah State Developmental Center and find out where they get their MAMP training done and their other training. They deal with autistic people. They deal with mentally challenged and mentally handicapped people that have severe behaviors all the time, have to have one-on-one -on -one workers with them constantly because of the behaviors. Not one of those workers pack a gun. There's no reason for that to happen. There's no reason for anything like the Darien Hunt situation to happen. There needs change desperately, whether it's training, in mental health issues, racial, whatever it is, we are better than this and we need to do something about it and not stand by and turn a blind eye to it and think that it's not our problem because it's all of our issue, every one of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maggie. Uh, as I mentioned, Maggie was very patient and stayed on for quite a while waiting to speak. And I also just want to flag that, um, you know, we've been talking or heard several comments related to the experience of calling. And, and obviously that involves um, dispatch, not just the officers that are on the street or the chief. And I think that's an area uh, of interest for this group. Quickly, I want to read a Facebook comment. Shelly McKissick says, how can we help spread unity between each other without riots, vandalism, burning property? Because we can talk all we want, but it takes a whole community to get active to make a positive change. Rebecca Jensen has been standing by. She's in East Central uh, Salt Lake City, and I'd like to take Rebecca's call. Rebecca, please go ahead if you're there. Uh, yes, uh, thank you so much. Um, yes, this is Rebecca Jensen, and um, Chief Brown and Mayor Mendenhall and commissioners, thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to share. Um, uh, and also the um, the call and the importance of uh, of listening to each each other and and all the callers um, before me. Um, this has been very informational. Um, I, I two points. Um, I I attended um, the Citizens um, uh, Academy uh, in um, October or yeah the fall of, of 2019. And um, I would just like to say how valuable that was for me um, to understand better um, what police officers go through. And, um, and it uh, helps me understand uh, not just the police culture, but also um, the culture here in Utah. Um, uh, I'm not originally from here. And so it was very instructional. And it was also instructional to hear other citizens in the community and what they're concerned about. 
Um, and I would encourage um, everybody else to um, all, all other concerned citizens to look into that. Um, I think it's very useful. Um, and before we point fingers, we should perhaps um, open our ears and, and, and listen to what our police officers have to go through first. Um, and then the second point um, is uh, I, I don't know what the what the situation is with um, with the officers, but I um, I sincerely hope that um, here in Salt Lake City we are making every um, every possible um, availability to help our officers to live in the community in, in the in the jurisdiction that they um, serve. Um, because I know that it can only help us as, as citizens, as, um, if our officers are living where they serve, um, if, you know, if they're commuting all the way to, you know, I don't know, to Utah County, to, and then I, I think everybody understands what I'm saying. Yeah, absolutely. Um, anyway, um, Okay, good. thank you. For, thank you so much. Um, I, and um, I, I know there are many other callers, but um, I just, um, I, I appreciate very much. Um, I'm very grateful for everything that you do. And any time that I have ever been stopped, um, I haven't been stopped in Utah, but I have been stopped in California. And I have always taken it as a learning experience. Um, what if it's like for a traffic stop. Um, and I'm very grateful for it. So um, I would encourage anybody who's listening, if you if you ever get stopped, maybe think of it as a possibility to learn something. Um, maybe that's crazy to say that. Not crazy. Um, I'm, I'm I, smiling only because I, I think you're a better person than I. Uh, but <laughs> no, I no, I, 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 I could have maybe like killed somebody doing like a, a right hand turn. Um, and I got stopped at a, um, a very busy. Um, this is this is in in California. And I'm so grateful that I got that ticket, because I didn't know. And so um Anyway, and, and, and then I also, we're not allowed to talk on the phone in California with our, our, our cell phones. And I, I got a ticket for that. And Understood. after that, I got an earpiece. And anyway, so you understand. Anyway. We're going to, we're going to let you go. So but, uh, much. Thank you so um, much. Yes, okay. For thank you. That. Thank you. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. You're, so, you're uh, welcome. Have a lovely evening. Thank you. you. Too. I appreciate for everything. Okay. Uh, bye -bye. We're going to okay. go to uh, Reza, who uh, has called from Salt Lake City uh, with some, uh, some perspective. Uh, Reza, if you're there, please go ahead. Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, so, you know, last year uh, I was driving home from work. I'm a contractor. So I, I strive on my car to, uh, you know, survive. <laughs> and I got in a wreck and it was an accident, obviously. And the guy that I had hit, he, he was telling me not to call the police. The last time I had that happen, um, the lady gave me bad insurance information. So this time I was like, no, no, no I'm going to call a police officer. So I called the police officer to the crash site. And the cop gave me a ticket for following too close. My car was mangled. It was totaled. Like... He gave me the ticket, and then I also had to pay the fine. Plus, I had I didn't have gas insurance, so I had to pay another two thousand dollars to the car that I had lost. I mean, when I've talked to other friends who had had a similar situation, usually the cops give them a warning and let them go without a ticket because losing a car is punishment enough for being in that accident, hmm. especially when you have to pay two thousand dollars on something that you know uh that you don't have anymore and then that also was you know my livelihood i had to figure out how to get a new car and all that stuff but right. it was just crazy that i ended up getting the ticket when i was the one that called the police hmm. and then i lost the car too on top of it interesting so i had to pay out more money and do the driver's ed and, and it was just like the car, losing the car was punishment enough, but the officer was like, I still have to do what I have to do. But I, I taken a criminal justice class and I understand, and I took it at Salt Lake Community College. And that professor actually was an ex-cop who said that 
most cops have some discretion whether or not to give somebody a ticket in certain instances. And even if it's a car accident, they don't have to give a ticket. It's up to them. They have a little bit of discretion. So, so you would have liked to have seen them. You would have leave. liked to have seen him use discretion in this case. Yeah, you know, I told him I was like, "Do you see my car here in the middle of the street, mangled? It's probably totaled. More than likely, it's totaled." And he just looked at me and he's like, "I have to do what I have to do." And Understood. he didn't use any discretion at all. It's like I'm he was sure. using a power move. I don't know what it was. I, I hear what you're saying. I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, let you go for now. But I uh, definitely uh, appreciate you giving us this uh, perspective and, and sharing this story with us. And I'm sorry for what you went through. It sounds like quite an ordeal, but thanks for calling. Yeah, that is good. Just no, it, it, it just wasn't fair at all how he treated me. I hear you. So. Thank you for calling. Um, and I apologize for having to be uh, a little bit short uh, with our calls, folks, just trying to, to make sure we get to everybody. There was another Facebook comment uh, from Bobby and Belinda Saltiban. Salt Lake City School District is a majority minority district. Are the school resource officers or SROs reflective of the changing demographics? And do we need SROs in schools? That's a comment from Facebook. All right, we're going to go to Tash, who has been standing by for quite some time. Tash, if you're there, um, please go ahead. You're on the air. All right, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, so I have two questions that are um, directed towards Mendenhall and Brown. Um, so I'd like to know why the um, police, like police is being, Salt Lake City police is being used um, for like, suppose a, a quote unquote health department pushing, pushes when CDC like advises against pushing against, against pushing the unsheltered right now with COVID. My second question is that why when these police officers are on or show up to these pushes and stuff like that, um, <clears throat> or anywhere really, um, they don't identify themselves um, per, um, you know, their code, um, the code, sorry, I can't remember the code right now, but it says they need to identify their first name or initial of the first name and last name. It is police regulation 1021.4.3B that says that they have to have a cloth nameplate um, that be worn at all times. Um, show the initial, the first initial, last name, um, their number. When we ask for these, for this information, for the identification, they deny. Just blatantly say no. I do not have to. So Brown, can you um, clarify, you know, that is, if that's true or not, and also um, making sure that you you train your men to, you know, do this when they're on the field, when they're engaging with um, with civilians or or not. Thank you so very I'd much. I'd like a response to that. Yeah, thank you very much, Tash. And we are going to work to get you a response. I was also just told uh, that there is a an Ask Me Anything, a, a, an event that takes place on reddit.com, R-A-D-D-I-T.com, I believe. Uh, Mayor, I, may, I might be mistaken, um, but I, I want to make sure that uh, next week there is going to be an Ask Me Anything uh, related to um, related to homelessness. It's on Facebook, I'm being told. So I guess on the city's Facebook okay, page. Okay, so can Mendenhall and Brown address my questions right now? You know, we, we, we just need to get to all of the rest of our callers, but we will be getting a follow-up to you, Tash. I, I assure you of that. We will get to a follow-up to you, but I do need to get to the remaining callers. Thank you for calling. Uh, I'm going to go next to David, who I know has been uh, waiting for quite some time. David, thanks for waiting. If you're there, please go ahead. Hello. Uh, good evening, and, and to all the callers, too. Um, I'm calling because um, the, the name of uh, my, my debate is, is um, the, the term equity. Yeah, the, the whole council is based on policing in the context of policing is about equity and not equality. Uh, and I wonder if you could expand on the uh, contrast between the two. Um, when it comes to community policing, are we looking for equality or equity? And for you, David, is that term a, that, um, yeah, what's, what, what does it come down to term. for you? Pardon? What does it come down to for you, or how do you evaluate which it well, should be? Well, basically, I, I see it as, as equality treats everybody the same. Equity teach, teach, treats people very differently, depending on their needs, wants, or desires. And that's where I have a little conflict. 
understand with uh, using using the term equity. I've noticed that's become a very common exchange. That yes, they sound similar, but mean quite differently things. Their goal is similar, right? Is to to make things fair. Sure. Uh, but when it, it comes to policing, uh, you know, what what constitutes being equity in hiring and training and things like that versus equality? Right. Well, thank you for to train different officers differently because of their genetic backgrounds or, you know, uh, you David, know, you thank, yeah, th- th- thanks for raising uh, that uh, distinction. I mean, it is something that I've heard many times, that question about the difference between equality and equity. And I'm sure the commission will have something to say about that as they move forward. Thanks for the call. Uh, Michael uh, from Salt Lake City uh, has been waiting a while. Michael, go ahead. Hi. Um, thank you so much for waiting so long. And for y'all going uh, late on this, I'll hop right into it. Um, I've seen Mendenhall's policy on police not taking like cold weather gear from homeless folks here. Um, but then also like on Instagram, I see videos of police even last winter pre COVID going around sites like the library and they just have like a trailer full of just like tents and sleeping bags. And it was super confusing to me as a civilian. And like, I'm sure that there is a technical legal explanation for why it might be okay to be taking these items from the homeless folks. But as a civilian, it's hard for me to understand how the mayor and police are in compliance with that sort of a policy. Um, just like I'm a state employee and I understand kind of like that regulatory systems can be complex and convoluted, but just some rhetorical questions to help explain kind of how I as a civilian view this is I just, I wonder why the gear is being taken. Is it because they're being arrested when they're released from jail? Do you have any documentation that, you're returning the gear to them. Um, if you're not after they're released from jail, like, where's it going? Um, those are rhetorical questions. It's just really confusing and depressing to see as an outsider. But on my general note um, is with instances like this, I think it demonstrates that lines of thinking between police and civilians exist in distinctly different realms. There was a specific police interaction posted to the SLCPD YouTube page called Activist Arrest, January 1st, 2020. And the video description describes the body cam footage as, quote, the other side of the story. Um, But in watching it, I see the same story as the activist footage, is it was basically two homeless folks were arrested, one of them for failure to, like, stop at a stop sign several years earlier. There's a man shouting, asking for personally identifiable information of the homeless folks being arrested so he can offer them assistance in jail. He ends up being arrested, too. It was a total mess. Um, And just, I think... Knowing that that was posted on the SLCPD uh, YouTube page as the other side of the story, it really struck me as representative of how divergent these trains of thought are between the police department and the civilians that are being policed. And I thought that that was just something that I wanted to point out. Yeah, thanks Um, for thanks for raising that, Michael. Yeah, sorry. um, No, no worries. Um, So just the one idea for change that I have is actually um, just in using more police discretion. Just as a district attorney can use their prosecutorial discretion to prioritize or deprioritize the legal prosecution of certain crimes, I believe that police could better exercise their personal discretion in deciding in their day-to-day jobs which crimes they would really want to, really which ones they want to pursue and follow through with, you know, all the way to their end. Um, Honestly, maybe that's a terrible idea. I wouldn't know. I'm not a police officer. Um, And I think that it's important to recognize that the police they do know these systems well. They hopefully know where the weak points are in policing structures. Um, and then uh, the final comment is, with all due respect, I don't believe that we can get substantial changes in belief, uh, substantial changes in our policing structure so long as the SLCPD um, recognizes, as, as, so long as they continue to believe that they're you know, among the best police forces in the country. Even if that were true, I think that if you believe you're the best in the country, the need for substantial reform becomes substantially less important and less pressing. And that's something that I've seen, you know, expressed internally and externally with the police force. And just as so long as civilians have such a divergent train of thought with how the police interact with the community, I think that uh, that needs to be recognized. That's all. Thank you so much for the time. Well, thank you, Michael. I mean, what a, what a, uh 
a thorough uh, amount of comments that you gave us there, uh, and we really appreciate it. Certainly, this is the um, the uh, there's been a lot of comments related to uh, those uh, who are not currently housed, and, and that's very valuable information. I know that um, some folks may be confused as to why the commission, why Mayor Mendenhall, why our Chief Brown uh, not directly responding, and, that, and that's because we've asked them to uh, sort of take the the um, stance, if you will, of listening. Um, and that's so that we could get to all of the extraordinary calls that we've heard tonight. If we had gone into responses uh, to each call, um, we likely would have heard from just a fraction of the folks that we got to hear from tonight. And so I apologize for those who may have uh, wished to get an answer immediately. I do want to let you know, not only are we going to be following up with you, but we will be publishing uh, online to the best that we can uh, any information that is uh, relevant and able to be shared uh, in follow up to what uh, was raised in questions uh, tonight. I also want to clarify something that I um, inadvertently said before related to the uh, ask me anything that uh, the mayor mentioned. It's a virtual panel and question and answer session on unsheltered homelessness addressing challenges in Salt Lake City. That's Monday, February 1st, this coming Monday at noon on Facebook on the SLC government page. Once again, that's Monday the 1st at noon on Facebook at the SLC government page, a virtual panel and Q&A on unsheltered homelessness addressing challenges. And Mayor, thanks for letting me know of that so that we could connect the dots. Um, also just wanna generally, before I take our last caller, just uh, you know reiterate how grateful we are, all of us, for all of these um, extraordinary perspectives that we've been able to hear. I have a caller who didn't give us a name. Um, that This will be our last call of the evening. Um, so uh, caller, if you're there, please go ahead. Just a few examples. Hi, I was calling um, and I'm in and out of another meeting, but my question was going to be about diversity training. How often are the police um, having that diversity training? So I am a Pacific Islander. And so one of the things um, that happened in our culture um it, it's a situation that has happened before where um to look a, a a person in the eyes um can be disrespectful so for police officers uh wanting to speak to a pacific islander young man and that's the other thing is i have boys and if they get pulled over they look older than their age and so if a police officer pulls them over asks them their age and because they appear to be older, they are, they're treated differently. So my question is, is how often is diversity training being done um, within the academy and once they leave there um, while they're in the workforce? And what does that look like? Who's over that? I mean, all the details of that. Because there's been several times of racial profiling um, I mean, with my own experience as well. I, I'm so glad that uh, you were able to stick around and give us that incredibly helpful comment. Uh, that is something that, that I personally wasn't directly aware of. I had heard that there were cultural mores that differed in terms of eye contact, but that is such a valuable piece of input for the commission, the mayor, the chief, and the council. So thank you so much for sticking around so long to uh, make that uh, comment. Thanks for calling. Um, there was one additional Facebook comment I wanted to read. It says, it is obvious that when racial representation is intentional, you can find qualified folks who are excellent. So how is the city and departments actively and intentionally diversifying their departments outside of the commission? Finding excellent professionals of color should not solely be isolated to the commission like this. Walk the talk. Again, that's a quote from Facebook. Well, folks, we've been on uh, quite a journey of uh, understanding tonight, uh, hearing from um, folks from all across the community. I wanted to share with you all that while we don't have Nielsen ratings for SLC TV, I can tell you that over a thousand people uh, were joined on the phone with us tonight uh, and countless others were texting and, and watching without uh, being dialed in. Um, before we close, I um, just wanted to allow any of our, our listeners, which is to say uh, the commissioners, 
Mayor Mendenhall, Chief Brown, Council uh, Member Fowler, and any other council members still with us. If there's anything that you wanted to just very briefly share as a, as a takeaway, as something that you heard tonight that uh, you are taking with you and wanted to share with us. So uh, the floor is yours uh, just to, to wrap things up. As a commissioner, I'd just like to say thank you to the community for their input. Thank you very much, Reverend Davis. Appreciate it. This is Commissioner Salazar Hall. I, I would like to say that the there are a lot of questions that have been asked tonight. Um, and I've been told that there will be a public frequently asked questions uh, type of uh, forum that would be provided to the public with answers to these questions because I, I wanted I do want to make sure that these questions are all answered and and made available to the general public and I, I do appreciate everybody's participation tonight. Thank you Commissioner for saying that and I've put on the screen uh, the website that is being used not just for conveying information to you all but for you all to contribute additional input so we really hope you will visit slcrepcommission.com. Again, slcrepcommission.com. The comments that you make there are as useful to us as the comments that were made tonight. And that uh, website will stay up for quite some time. We really hope you will take advantage of that and share it with friends and neighbors who may have an interest in this topic. Uh, so again, we'll be posting information there, including a frequently asked questions and some additional responses. But we invite your comments, most importantly, at slcrepcommission.com. Uh, As you might guess, a lot of people uh, came together to make a program like this happen. I just want to quickly single out the folks at SLC TV for extraordinary work and sticking with us and putting this broadcast together. Also want to thank the folks at the Langdon Group, uh, including Siobhan Locke, Jennifer Fowler, and lots of others who uh, contributed. I want to thank my colleague Dante James for helping uh, get me ready for this event and make sure it was a success. I want to thank all of the commissioners for being here and for listening and for their service, their volunteer service. I want to thank Chief Brown for his uh, diligence in participating not just tonight, uh, but in a number of commission uh, conversations, as well as his uh, team, Mayor Mendenhall, Council Member Fowler, and the City Council. Thank you all for both your leadership and your time uh, with us uh, tonight. The biggest thanks, though, goes to you, you who are listening and you who are watching, for giving of yourselves tonight, for giving us your feedback, for helping make Salt Lake City uh, a better place. So on behalf of the Racial Equity and Policing Commission, this is Larry Schooler saying thank you and good night.